In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Titus. And uh, one thing that you do need to know before we go into this is just remember that Titus is a pastoral epistle, which means when Paul is writing it, he's specifically talking not to a congregation like he is in Ephesians or Colossians. He's not talking to a whole congregation. He's talking specifically to church leaders. And so because of that, he addresses them slightly differently. So let's look at Titus 3, 8 through 9, where he says, This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed in God will carefully engage in good deeds. These things are profitable for men. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. There's a couple things that I want you to really sort of hone in on here. That Paul is giving advice for how church leaders are supposed to speak. First of all, he says, concerning these things that I've taught you, the things that I've addressed earlier in this epistle, I want you to bring this to the church. And when you do it, I want you to speak confidently. So these are kind of a little advice from Paul on good leadership practices specific to the church that I want you to speak confidently because you know where this has come from. You know that it is the inspired word of God. And because of that, I want you to speak with a certain level of boldness and confidence, knowing that God is with you when you do that. Because he says that the reason for that is not so that they can gain glory or prestige or that other people think well of them, the real goal, the mission behind all of that is I want the people of your congregation to thrive and to grow closer to God because I want them to do good deeds. And what do those good deeds do? They edify one another. Paul says that they are profitable to the people, not only the people that have good deeds done for them, but the people doing the good deeds themselves. Which means that the reason that he wants the leadership to be the best that they can be and to speak confidently and boldly and encourage and inspire the people that are there at their congregation to do these good works and to sort of spur them on and encourage them, is he said, it's going to make your congregation better. It's going to make the people around your congregation better because good deeds are being done. And essentially, that's what your job is. Because... Isn't that really what we as church leaders are tasked with? We are supposed to encourage the brethren around us, the ones that we're helping lead, to do good works and to live a godly life. And he's saying that part of that is to speak with confidence and boldness and declare the word of God, because if you do that and you do your job, you do what I've asked you to, then those that you've been given charge over are going to be made better people because of it, because you inspire them to do the work of God. Church leaders have an obligation to hone their skills in leadership, in speaking and bringing people and teaching them. They have an obligation to improve themselves and be the best that they can be in all of those things so that the people they are leading can also be the best that they can be. And you have to remember that if you're a church leader, God is going to help you with that. There are countless examples in the Bible of people that were not in great positions to be leaders. And after some time spent with God, they became some of the greatest leaders in all of human history. People like Abraham and Moses and Joseph and David. And because of that, they became better people and they made other people around them better by their presence, because they had a trust in God and they did what God asked them to. Because these good deeds are profitable 
for men, which, by the way, also implies that there is a relationship between competent leaders and the abilities and the drive of those whom they are leading. So remember, church leaders, you do have an amazing responsibility because you're also going to be held accountable for how you prepared others. Did you prepare people to do evangelism? Did you prepare people to go out and do good works? Did you encourage them when they were struggling with things like sin or sickness? Because if you didn't, and if they, I mean, some people, even if you do the right thing, they're not going to respond to that, and that's not your fault. But if you don't do your job and they don't become what they're supposed to be and their relationship with God is injured by not having good church leadership, you're going to be held accountable to that because there is a relationship there. There is a correlation between good leadership and a good congregation. And finally, Paul recommends that leaders need to be wise and pick their battles based on their importance. Because he's saying, these things that I've been talking about the crux of Christianity. In other words, loving God, loving your neighbor, doing good deeds, doctrinal soundness, those things are important and those things are worth fighting for. And then by contrast, he gives this sort of, he does give this contrast between those things and then what he calls foolish controversies, genealogies, strife, and disputes about the law. There are some things that are absolutely worth going to the mat for. But Paul is saying there's a lot of things that people fight about that it is not worth causing division in the brothers or breaking up a congregation over. And he says, even if it doesn't break up the congregation, we all know that having those disputes and having those fruitless and foolish disagreements, it hurts the brethren and it hurts their ability to do what they're supposed to do and be the kingdom of God. And so because of that, leaders also have a responsibility to pick their battles, and to avoid getting into foolish controversies. Controversies that really don't matter at the end of things. Now, in the heat of the moment, sometimes we can forget this. We're human beings. We can get caught up in what we're doing or what we're saying. Our desire to be right can be so strong that we forget to keep focused. But what Paul is saying here is the church leader's primary Goal. Their primary concern ought to be with the people that are there and that they are helping lead, edifying one another and doing good deeds. He says if you do that and if you focus on that, then you're going to be profitable to other people and profitable to the, th- to the kingdom of God. You see, church leaders have a responsibility that has everlasting consequences. And the truth is, The Lord is always in need of trustworthy workers. And when he has them, not only is everybody around them made better, but God rewards them for the good that they've done. Let's all remember that and try to continue to do profitable good works throughout our daily lives. Have a good weekend. Stay the course, friends. So in case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian man. In case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male. (laughs) In case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male and a small government constitutionalist which means that I have no chance of getting any help from the government and probably wouldn't accept it even if they offered. Just in case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male and a small government constitutionalist, which means I have no chance of getting any help from the government and wouldn't accept their help even if they offered. Which means I'm going to need you to like and subscribe because my gun collection is not going to pay for itself.